Um, so each of your organizations is driving innovation in healthcare and life science, albeit in different ways. How are investors leveraging um, your advancements to create alpha? And in finance, alpha means profit. In, at Johnson & Johnson, it means literal profit. Um, how are investors leveraging your advancements to create alpha or, or increase revenues? And what investment strategies do each of you see most promising for the future? Start with Sanjeev. Yeah, so uh, Sandy, um, I'm I'm not an expert on on the financial side. You know, I I do know the life sciences space better. So, I'll give some inputs and I'll let others sort of pitch in. You know, how how you can make sort of investment decisions um, in in your respective areas. So, you know, as as I've been in life sciences for the last 15 years, one of the interesting dynamics that we are seeing is that. And again, these are my opinions, not the opinions of the company, just to, you know, as a disclaimer, that blockbuster drugs are starting to wind down. I mean, if you look at your, you know, your Lipitors and your Viagra's of the likes uh, in, in the 2000s, you're seeing less and less of that happening. And so what the big pharma companies are now trying to do is get into more specialized areas. And we're seeing a trend where you know, the oncology and immunology aspects of what we call as the therapeutic areas are becoming more prevalent. And there's a lot of focus on that. At, at j, &J we we're focusing on about 70 product launches. And out of that, 90% of them are, are in the oncology and immunology space. And with that, like I talked about before, that the complexity of this, uh, of this uh, you know, treatment of diseases is also becoming more and more obvious uh, to all of us. So, you know, the way we are starting to think about this is, okay, how do we target the right sort of customers? Again, it's, it's more around accounts. Healthcare accounts is what we are going after. So the more we can understand the healthcare accounts, which you, you think about the hospitals, you think about, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the big companies out there that are purchasing in bulk, those are the ones we are trying to now target. And, and trying to sort of understand uh, understand better, and, and so that's that's one shift that uh, that we're seeing. The other is a lot of these major products, you know, block a billion dollar drugs are coming off patent. Uh, we what we call is LOE as well, and you see that in 2025 going into 2026 onwards, and that's you know these product launches. Hopefully, that we're we're looking to to have will offset. The, uh, the revenues, the loss of revenues that we're gonna see uh, from, from these drugs. Uh, the other aspect that we are seeing is, you know, the IRA, the Influx, uh, in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And this is where uh, the pricing pressures are st starting to kick in uh, for, uh, for pharmaceutical companies. And we're also st looking, how do we sort of counter that, um, you know, as, as, as we move forward. So, and even more push than into the oncology and immunology space for, um, especially for big pharma. Great, thanks. Uh, Julia, how, is, um, how, how are investors leveraging advancements at, at Ernest? Yeah, so I think this kind of connects to some of the things I was hitting on previously, but I generally say that like alpha generation based on our products kind of falls into the category of using the data to gain a competitive edge around quarterly earnings, as I kind of spoke to previously. Um, we're, so we're putting together, we're using claims data sets and other data sets to put together quarterly earnings forecasts for really highly cared about products. And then we're proactively flagging to our clients cases where we think that there's a meaningful uh, potential for a beat or a miss relative to consensus estimates. Um, and in the best case scenario, you can correlate that with a real stock reaction. So we can see that a stock goes up when there's a meaningful beat relative to consensus, and we can forecast that. And so it's really measurable. Um, and then outside of kind of the more short-term quarterly earnings forecasting category, there's longer time horizon. Um, questions that our, that our clients are asking. So things like I mentioned around persistence or growth and adoption in particular indications. Um, and so looking at kind of secondary metrics that may, like things like, for example, we get a lot of questions around persistence on GLP-1s. So obviously we know that there's a massive market for GLP-1s, but there are questions when we think about net sales potential, like peak sales potential of these products around, well, what really matters is like what percent of patients that start on these therapies are actually staying on them durably 
over time. Um, and so that's, again, like not going to be something that materializes in a single quarterly earnings event, but is going to have real implications for the trajectory of the stock over the longer term. Wendy? Yeah, I think, um, so similarly to Sanjeev, I can comment a little bit on the investor perspective. And I, th I think it's, um, at Ation, we are really focusing on the tools for decision making. So across the board, whether it is investors or life sciences companies, device manufacturers, uh, companies that are evaluating how to put digital health solutions in place for whatever problems they are looking to address with digital health solutions. Um, I think that they are leveraging the tools to make better decisions, right? And, and that's really where the innovation is, is coming in, thinking about making those decisions differently, looking for unmet need in a different way with new data, looking to understand who is actually prescribing drug and where with the GLP-1s, for example, you aren't seeing those prescribed in what we would have called classical healthcare settings before. It, it means they are often not seen in previous kind of traditional data sources before. They aren't being covered by payers yet. So it's really early to be able to understand what really is happening, just as some real examples there. So um, we've had some real challenges there. And then there's a lot of innovation and focus from an investment perspective on how are we going to do more to get more information out of the technology that we are applying to patients. The biggest example that I'm gonna to use to try to translate that statement for you is, how do we use AI to get better, faster, and more information out of when we give patients MRIs or when we scan tumors, how are we going to use the technology tools that are now kind of raining down on top of us to get more and better information out of the data? And then how do we put those in place to make better decisions, right? Biggest innovation, best innovation you can make is better decision making. So that's where our customers and our investor partners are challenging us. And that's where we're, we will focus with our partners um, to do better and do more. Great, thank you. Andrew. Thank you, Sandy. I think this one's actually straight down the middle from my perspective. It's coverage, it's novelty, and at the end of the day, it's privacy and HIPAA compliance, right? Which pretty much no one in this room is good at, except maybe for some of us on the stage. From a coverage perspective, because of that denominator problem, right, you need, really need the broadest coverage if you're gonna get to the most accurate projections overall. And so the ability to synthesize across data sets potentially, or to work with like an earnest who's doing that synthesization for you, I think is really, really valuable because you're gonna see more of the market than you would probably see on your own. The second is novelty. Depending on how you actually think through the question, if you take a marketplace like Health Verity where we're seeing these expansive and also niche data sets, the ability to link them together and then synthesize that can show you things that you generally can't see anywhere else, even in some of the traditional go-to places that the market has gravitated to. And the third part is the HIPAA compliance. Because of the HIPAA regulatory framework across healthcare data, which is not true across a lot of the alternative data sets, the, the fundamental ability to deliver a data set that is already HIPAA compliant, that has already been normalized and transformed in a model such that you can actually just put it right to work, saves a lot of organizations here a lot of compliance issues and a lot of delay in making sure that the data is actually fit for purpose so that you can do the work that you want to do. And so I think, again, between the coverage, the novelty, and the privacy management, that's what we're really seeing in creating alpha in a lot of our clients. Can I, just, can I just follow up on that? I love that you said the novelty. And, and there's something that you said in there that um, I think is just really important for this audience. And it's about the asking the question. Um, that's, the, that's the best and most important innovation, sort of push towards innovation. When Sandy first came to us in um, thinking about the data that we were using as an investor and really applying a what was a traditional healthcare study lens to some of the questions he was trying to answer as an investor in portfolio companies, 
he was asking questions that maybe we had heard before, but in a different way, and really pushing us to think about those questions in a different way. And so I just wanted to kind of take a minute and hit on the novelty and the question asking, because the more that we are asking new questions or even different questions and really push the data to answer those new and different questions, I think that's where we get the fun stuff done as we think about data and innovation.